um, is a big part of Houston. So I'm going to yeah. have to Google her. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting. It's su- such a small art world. <laughs> um, okay. Well, we, we have a lot of people here already, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and get started and introduce okay. you. That's okay. Sounds good. Okay. I have to say, I do really like seeing, um, seeing your wall in the background and how things are hung oh, up. It's just so uh-oh. interesting to see. <laughs> are those... move it. <laughs> no, 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 go back, go back. It's so, it's great to have like oh. insight into, um, so... you know, your working habits and stuff. So that's what I'm looking at as I look past you. But anyway, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. Um, I just first want to thank Marcus, who is the kind of amazing um, person behind these Zooms that we've been doing at University of Houston. So thank you, Marcus, for that. And I want to welcome Barbara Takanaga to everyone um, who is here from New York City. She's an abstract painter interested in images that can be read both abstract and representational, microscopic and cosmic. Recent solo exhibitions include DC Moore Gallery in New York City, the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art in Omaha, Robichon Gallery in Denver, a 20 year survey at the Williams College Museum of Art and wall installations at Space 42 of the Newberger Museum, as well as Mass MoCA. Barbara's a 2020 recipient of a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship and has worked in many public and private collections. She's represented by DC Moore, Robichon Gallery, and by print publishers Shark Inc. and Wingate Studio. Her work has been reviewed in a variety of publications, including the New York Times, Art in America, The New Yorker, Hyperallergic, and Art Critical. Barbara lives and works in New York City and is a professor of art um, emerita at Williams College. We're so excited to have you here, Barbara, as I told you before, and um, we just can't wait to hear what you have to say. So I'll be back at the end with questions, but in the meantime, I'm going to sign off and and listen in. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Marcus. I'm going to um, see if I can do this. I have to host disabled participant screen sharing. So Dana, I think- think, um, Marcus, are you able to fix that? He should still be here and I, I'm sure he'll get that fixed. Okay. See, try, okay. try it. Um, it should be okay uh, right now. Uh, okay, you thank you, got it. All right. And, and, whoop, hold on. And almost there. Uh oh. Uh, got it. Oh, hello. Let's start way back at the beginning and let's start again. So sorry. Okay, well, in this case, I'm just going to keep moving. You get a preview here. All right, all right, are we good? We're good. Um, Okay, Uh, so I've done a lot of these lectures and I have to say that um, what I thought was a kind of decent one, um, I took a look at it before I, was starting today and I thought, oh my God, uh, I have to do this over. It had become kind of a Frankenstein monster of being um, cobbled together and collaged. So um, you're, you're, I'm experimenting on you. In general, I like doing lectures um, that I think of as kind of like a, a lateral fungus underground that you go sideways as opposed to in a kind of hierarchical um, process. So uh, I like being able to veer off topic. I've tried not to do that too much. Um, I timed this and I did come in uh, kind of late, like about 15 minutes. So I'm going to try to read portions so I don't get too distracted. Um, But I'm just going to start and uh, talk about some things and show you images in the background of paintings uh, without saying much about them. Um, these are all acrylic on either linen or 
um, wood panels and they, they range in, side, in size from, uh, you know, like 12 by 10 inches up to uh, actually wall size. So, um, one of the things that was interesting about revising the lecture was that it, in some ways it was a lot, um, there was a kinship in terms of the way one fixes a painting or the way I fix a painting, which is you wanna keep all the good parts and you wanna paint out all the bad parts and then you sort of wrestle with it and then you leave it overnight and you come back to it and hope that somehow it's fixed itself. Um, so starting uh, in terms of talking about issues that underlie some of the work, um, these are things that have stayed with me for a long time, even though the image itself uh, has morphed and changed over the years. Um, first of all, I would say um, I have a real problem with change. I have a real problem with empathy or with not empathy, <laughs> with entropy. I want things to stay the same. It's such a human issue and a dilemma. Uh, and I mean change as in trying to hold running water in your hand, holding time still, keeping away death, that great unknowing aspect. It runs through literature and art and definitely religion and so many other things, how we deal with that, how we want to live forever like a vampire. But we also know it's both impossible, unnatural and probably evil. I know, really. Uh, I can see you thinking, yeah, right, that's in the work. I don't, I don't see it. Um, it's there for me, it may not be apparent. I think this, this happens to all of us, um, but this is a good place where um, I could talk about what uh, an old teacher of mine, George Woodman, used to call the intentional fallacy. And he would talk a lot about how you can have all the intentions in the world. You can have all the deep thoughts that you want about what you're doing. And then you put it out there and it's open to um, the point of view of whoever is looking at it. So there's a certain amount that you cannot control. I know more recently contemporary artists, um, we, not me, but like to write about our work and try to direct some of that intention. But I, I do think there's something to this whole idea of, um, of that it stands for itself. Uh, a second aspect that has run through all of this for a long time is um, a love of abstraction. Even when it tips over into coding, and I'll spell that C-O-D-I-N-G as opposed to the, the drug, the cold remedy, um, coding and uh, symbolism, I think. Um, uh, abstraction obviously is, is ancient. Um, but it, what, it, what I like about it, it, it allows for an open-ended possibilities. It circumvents language and naming things. And in general is less narrative, even though clearly abstraction can be very narrative. Um, I'm, I'm trying to read off two things here since I kind of, my, uh, my presenter view is kind of obstructed. <laughs> um, the third thing comes from this love of uh, that comes from this love of abstraction is the idea of standing in the middle, um, which again is an old idea in philosophy and literature. Uh, it, it does seem like I'm working a lot from old ideas. Um, for example, I've always been interested in the um, English Romantic movement in literature and their ideas of the reconciliation of opposites, or in Eastern philosophy where. Um, Enlightenment often involves being able to hold seemingly opposite or opposing ideas at the same time. As they say, yin yang, you're my thing. Um, I'm also, uh, somebody else I would probably include in this is T.S. Eliot and the still point. Um, I've always been interested in that line between naming and abstraction, between the microscopic and the astronomical. And the fourth thing is um, work and labor. Um, I do kind of feel like uh, work is one of the few things that 
as artists that we can control. You know, a, a lot of being a successful artist has to do with luck. Luck is big. Uh, timing, being in the right place at the right uh, moment. But I do feel strongly that um, going to work, whatever that means, whatever kind of artist you are, uh, is hugely important. Um, one question that I've been asked a lot, and I'm, um, I've been asking some of you, uh, the, the grad students as well, is um, how, do I, how did I get involved in art? For me, it began as a youngster growing up in the middle of Nebraska and getting praise for being able to draw well. I think a lot of us come to art that way. It's something about being recognized in a positive way and we respond to that. Praise is a great motivator. Um, my little anecdote is that my mother um, wanted to help uh, encourage me as a creative kid, but there were no art classes or there's no place to actually make art when I was little in our town. So she uh, enrolled me or got, she didn't even enroll me, she got our neighbor lady to teach me how to make uh, artificial cherry blossoms. And that was um, my big start in art. Later, when you're a young artist, um, and I know lots of you are young artists, um, how to decide what to make art about. I think that's such a big thing, right? Um, it's hard to figure out given um, what other people are saying, what the trends are, um, how to listen to your own voice. Um, it's such a big umbrella, um, a, a, which I love about art. It's a great umbrella. I mean, you could be interested in cooking, right? You could be interested in um, uh, beauty, uh, sort of self-therapy, social practice, politics, um, narrative, uh, the figure, the satisfaction of making, uh, or humor, if I had had my choice, I would have uh, made uh, art that was really funny, but I never could figure out how to do that. Uh, and then of course, there's the allure. Oh, yeah, I don't wanna talk about that. Well, let's skip on to the next slide. <laughs> um, so I've alluded to these underlying ideas, but another aspect that I feel strongly about is the actual pleasure that one gets from making art. That for me is one of the great payoffs. And I've talked to some people this morning about what the payoff is in terms of one's art making. Um, I used to laugh and think that it's a kind of Marxist thing that, that I'm keeping society safe by staying in my studio and making art. And we could go down a, a rabbit hole of talking about um, Hitler and what would have happened if he had been a successful or um, successful artist instead of a crazy person. Um, and sometimes a bit of therapy. I know that's kind of uh, maybe not a, a thing we like to talk about, but I, I do think that there is such a wonderful parallel between making art, what one does, and your other life, your regular life. Um, I think about how that payoff solidifies as one ages. Things happen, the bank of experience gets fat. Um, definitely, I think one trusts in the work more as the years pile up. Um, I'm gonna quote um, this interview that um, my good friend and wonderful artist, Leslie Wayne did with me. And uh, she wrote, the great Anne Magnuson, the performance doyenne of the 80s East Village scene, describing her life and career, she said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that for years she climbed and climbed the hills and mountains of middle age. And when she finally got to the top and looked over the edge, what she saw was the valley of fuck it, which, <laughs> which I love. And I haven't got to the edge yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. Um, in a lecture, this is a blank image. <laughs> in a lecture, I think all of this is related to a desire to start at the beginning and move chronologically through time up to the present. I have a good friend, an art historian, who wonders why we artists like to do that, that it's very inefficient. But I think it's because our work seems to us at least uh, all of one piece. Um, the work as a whole is always changing, evolving, responding to our own history, and 
it's interesting to us, even though it's not interesting to anybody else. So starting at the beginning, I was born and raised, as I said, in a little town in the middle of Nebraska, uh, one of a very few Asian American families. So you might think that identity politics would have played a larger role in my work, but interestingly, it is not until recently. This is not my work. I wish it were my work. This is Solowit. I hope you recognize this. This is earlier, his earlier work. Um, I started out as a printmaker and it has informed my work immensely. Uh, there's a great love of process and labor, obviously. But um, when I was uh, in, in graduate school, I got assigned to do a presentation on Solowit and, and it was such a wonderful discovery. His work was such a wonderful discovery. Um, uh, you probably know this, but he was uh, initially very, very involved in systems and, and seriality and ordering. And this notion that uh, once you set up a system or these rules, that it was more important that you followed through than the finished product. That was the emphasis was on the process, not the product. And I love that for a lot of reasons. One is um, it's sort of like a, uh, uh, religions that say, you know, don't concentrate on heaven, concentrate on, on living uh, uh, your life. Or um, I think an easier thing for me was that when you adhere to this kind of uh, idea, you actually opt out of a certain amount of responsibility, which I think sounds like a negative, but for me, I, I sort of loved that. It's a kind of standing in the middle again. So, um, this is one of my uh, prints from graduate school. Um, I was, as I said, very interested in seriality, sequencing and variations on a theme. This is a lithograph. It's a square um, and it's a thing that I still do, which is little small shapes making a bigger shape. So it was printed and then I would rotate it because it was a square, I could rotate it um, 90 degrees and reprint that same image or in this case, 180 degrees. So you could go from this to this. And then I would put them all together um, in a wall mural, um, just pinned to the wall. And uh, so one addition would make one piece. And this is a, these are terrible uh, images because I took, this is the day of when we were taking slides. So <laughs> I took my own slides. Um, but this is uh, my thesis show, and you can see there are a couple big wall murals on, on the right side. And then there's this piece um, that was 52 feet long, and it had uh, three layers. The top, the top layer was the key image in printmaking, and then the second layer was rotated 180 degrees and reprinted. And the bottom layer was this sort of play option where I could do whatever I wanted, and I could stick hairpins through it or cut it up or lay it on the floor or whatever. And, and it occurred to me that it was this kind of illustration of a, the emergence of a thought, you know, that it starts out from this sort of creative chaos and it, it blooms up through order. Um, the other thing that I, I love about this, going back to this idea of change and wanting to hold things in time, I always thought um, printmaking was great because you could keep the original. You know, you made 30 of them. You could put one in a drawer, it stayed the same. It was the vampire. And then you had 29 other things you could mess with. Um, and I liked that um, option. So I did these pieces for a long time, these sort of wall murals um, with one, one image. I tried uh, die cutting things and doing three dimensional uh, pieces. This is about um, 16 feet tall. Um, and at some point after years and years of printmaking, I, um, I couldn't deal with the solvents anymore. So I tried to do what I call low-tech printmaking. So you can see on the left, there's a little stone there. And basically all I did was trace around the stone with a Sharpie. And that's what that red image is about. Um, and then um, so I was spray painting around objects, tracing things. Um, and I did this uh, piece, it's about uh, 12 feet tall, I think. Um, and it is, oh, maybe it's, well, I can't remember. It's around, it's, it's a fairly good sized piece. Um, and it's a, 
it's a funny piece in that I was working from those little white things you see on the on the floor were words, and there were seven words, and there was a construct, again, a kind of solid construct to, to how I formed those words. And then the words, I would go and find objects to fit the words, and then the objects determined the vertical uh, column behind the objects. So it was all about um, coding and symbols and looking things up in the dictionary. For instance, this one on the lower section, the, root, the word was root. So you've got square roots, you've got a tracing of my sister and myself, you've got uh, to draw water, that kind of thing. Um, there's soba noodles, there's obsidian, there's this stone. You can see I spray painted around the stone. And um, things got crazier and crazier in terms of trying to incorporate narrative, but really being a kind of flat cartoon abstract person. Um, so I did this piece called uh, Water Burn, which uh, even the title I think is this, these sort of opposites, like you don't think of water burning, but it's a term in printmaking. And um, it was based uh, kind of ridiculously now, but it was based on the little story of the Little Mermaid, Hans Christian Andersen. Um, but this was pre-Disney. So uh, it, it, it actually had a much darker ending um, at the time. I, I'm, I remember it being that in the end, the, the mermaid you know, gets her legs, but then she walks into the ocean and turns into foam, or alternately, she God sends a chariot of fire down and rescues her and takes her to heaven. But anyway, so this is this wacky thing. I didn't know anything about doing sculpture. Um, and it was, uh, so it was all this narrative about, you know, there she is, she's a mermaid. She's, she's got, she's in a tail, but basically it's like pants that have one leg and there's a fire bolt comes out of nowhere and there's a screaming fish. And then she turns upside down and out of her hands come this archway of fire. Um, there are little fish shoes that I made that are waiting for her. And then she falls out of her tail and lands on these bloody stumps into a doctor's waiting room. So, <laughs> and she touches the wall and the wall starts burning. Um, and everything here is, you know, traced um, or um, I traced shadows. I made a little fake Japanese rock garden. And then the last piece is that she's growing a new, a new tail. Um, and uh, I did these kind of big symbols um, pieces for a long time. I'm showing you this one only because I um, was interested in Japanese screens, which has come back to haunt me now in my, in my recent work. But I cut the top of, this, of the edge just to imply that kind of going back and forth. Um, this is called the long resonance. Um, and I, I was very interested in that dichotomy between work and, and private life. Um, uh, and I'm showing, so showing you this because this has also come back in my work, this, this curtain. At the time I thought of it as this blood curtain. I had seen a wonderful uh, piece in Italy of the blood coming out of Christ, this, the stigmata on Christ's hands, and it was sort of flowing upward uh, up his arm in these, this sort of like beautiful jeweled blood uh, necklace, almost like shape. So the whole thing with this is that, you know, you could put people behind it, or you could people put people in front of it or objects. Um, and then the end of this work came, I was always working on these hollow core doors and I got the shipment and it was so beautiful. The, the, the wood grain was fantastic. It was all um, bilateral symmetry and I just couldn't paint over it. So I just, again, going with this notion that you're tracing things, I just traced the wood grain and painted it in as it was. And they formed all these crazy torsos and heads. Um, they were funny, they were creepy. They, to me, kind of mimicked sagging aging bodies you can see there are two little clown figures and a torso and a little skull at the bottom um pareidolia right where you where you see faces in in abstract things 
Okay, there's a lot of work in between here that I'm not going to show you, but I did work for a long time, but I was working on that big scale. And people will say, well, what happened? What? Because then I suddenly worked on a tiny scale. I was working 12 inches by 10 inches. And what I always say is I had a nice big studio and then I had a 200 square foot studio. So I had a tiny studio and then I got a tiny dog. And then later on, I got another tiny dog. And I bring this up not only because I do love my dog, but um, one thing that had been published way back when, um, uh, and I used to get asked it in, in, uh, in lectures, was um, you were once quoted uh, about making paintings about your dog's butt. And I would always say, no, not my dog's butt, but those little spiral hair spirals on each side of my dog's butt. I should have said my dog's knee or maybe a cowlick on a person's head. But um, to me, the whole idea was was so funny um, that, that you have something so mundane as a cowlick of hair and that it is the same thing as a galaxy spiral. It was like uh, um, the cosmic and the ordinary and uh, kind of universal signage. So this is a painting I made. Um, one side, it's called Pancho and Lefty after the town's band Sant song. Um, so the left is my thumbprint and the right is my dog spiral. And I made a bunch of these little paintings for a while. And I got to this point where actually I had a, a real overnight epiphany, which is that I've been doing them. I've been thinking of them as animal kind of things. Um, and then, uh, the, I thought, what happens if instead of doing these little hair spirals, I just made them white instead of black and made the dark, the background dark instead of this sort of pale ochre sienna brown color. So I went from there to th this and it literally happened overnight. I made this painting and then I made this painting or a facsimile of this painting. Um, and that flipped everything because suddenly you were in outer space, right? You were these were stars, they weren't hairs. Um, and um, they were radial. They, uh, people wrote about them as being sort of big bang kind of things. Either they were extending outward or they were imploding inward. Um, really uh, for me, what they were elegies of a sort. The, uh, I think um, at the time, you know, uh, like, like all of us, it's sometime we have to deal with um, parents and, and mortality. Um, so, so I had been thinking a lot of these as sort of celebratory death paintings in a way. And um, I like to use this Joan Didion quote from the year of uh, magical thinking. She said, um, grief is passive, grief happens. Mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, the act of dealing with grief we, requires attention. And I loved that quote. And I'm thinking attention, what, what does that even mean? So for me, it meant labor. Um, it meant going to work. Um, it meant uh, repetition, sort of com compulsively, obsessively working, which was actually very soothing, very mindless and of great comfort. Um, uh, and I have talked to different artists about who use a lot of rep repetition in their work. Um, and I was listening to the radio one day and uh, I don't, I wish I could remember who said it. It might've been um, uh, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, I'm not sure, but they, they, they had this quote, uh, which was delay as, um, how did they say it? Uh, delay as, Repetition as delay into mythic time. And I, I love that. And I wasn't even sure what that meant. I mean, what is mythic time? Um, is it like, you know, Penelope weaving her tapestry, uh, waiting for Odysseus to return and, and using it as a, a way to delay making a decision about her suitors, right? She would weave it, she would unweave it, she would reweave it the next day. Um, I'm not sure, but I thought that was interesting. It's a kind of way of 
being aware of time and stretching it out at the same time. Um, so in my little um, parallel thing is I, um, I knit this sweater, this red sweater that um, I knit while I was sitting next to my mother while she was very sick. And um, I knit it and I put it together, sewed it together, I put it on, I took it off, I took it apart, put, rolled it into little balls and re-knit it. And I re-knit it two more times. So I had three versions of this sweater, which, you know, I don't usually wear red sweaters, so I actually never wore it. But there's something about comfort and futility. Um, people ask me about titles. This one's called Best of Us for the Rest of Us. Um, I'm often asked about uh, if I think the work is op, op art um, or psychedelic art, um, or, or I get asked a lot if I did a lot of drugs. And I, I have to say, I, I love op art. I like that it's, it's a visual, uh, visceral um, response in your body. It's a, it's a buzz and a push. So I, I, I do like that a lot. Um, they are uh, a little psychedelic or science fiction, I think sometimes because um, um, I, I like the high and low of that, right? Um, that they come from a lot of different sources. So I have this, uh, my one drug story that I will tell you just because I think it's really relevant. Um, and I've told this story a lot, but um, at one point uh, when I was very young, well, not that young, but you know, in my twenties, um, I had this epiphany while I was on drugs and I thought it was a groundbreaking, incredible, brilliant, most amazing thought that no one had ever had before. And I couldn't believe uh, my, my genius. So uh, I wrote it down on a piece of paper. And then the next morning I, um, I woke up and um, I had written down, the progress of man is the progress of man, which is hysterically funny because it means nothing, right? And uh, I also like to point out that this is the old days when man somehow included men and women and children. Okay, but the, the punchline of the story is that when I looked at the paper a couple of weeks later, I noticed that I had written the progress of capital M-A-N is the progress of lowercase M-A-N, which actually is a pretty incredible thought, even though it's again, a very old, old one and not original at all. Um, that an individual's life can be mirrored in um, the bigger, larger life of the group or the species. That small information can be carried um, in, the, in the large information, which is basically uh, a kind of fractal idea. So here is, for instance, a, not mine, this is a Mandel uh, illustration of a Mandel fractal. So you can see the small information is the same as the large information, or they always cite uh, fjords, for instance, are another uh, good example of this, the micro and the macro. So I like to do this little goofy thing, which is um, pairing, you know, the micro macro just for fun. So we've got trees, right? And we've got hairs and that kinship. You've got these wonderful frozen trees uh, in Lapland that have the same form as a fiddlehead fern. Or of course, spiral galaxy, as I mentioned before, and the wonderful baby head. I have a little aside here about that micro macro thing. Um, I love this, uh, I was reading an article and um, they were talking about astronomers and the notion of the long address. Um, and I'll quote, we live on earth, which is in the solar system, which is in the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way is part of a small cluster of gal galaxies called the local group, which is on the edge of the Virgo cluster, a conglomeration of several thousand galaxies. 
So I love that. That's the long address. And I like the idea that you could take it in the other direction, right? Into the um, molecular, into the atomic and beyond. So after making these paintings for about 10 years, these radial from the middle to the edge paintings, um, they were all basically the same composition, but with variations, again, a kind of Solowit thing. Um, the, the, the composition stayed the same. So in some ways I was into that idea that there was no change, but there was change at the same time. But um, I did feel like I was done grieving. I was done mourning. I felt like I couldn't make one more of these paintings. Um, I had loved making them and suddenly they were so boring and not fun at all. So I decided I had to change the work. And I was talking to someone earlier today about, about doing that. It's so hard, right? It's tough. Um, how does one do that? And um, I it wasn't that I was drawn to doing something else. It was just, I was done making this work. And so the teacher, like the teacher that I am, I thought, okay, you need to make yourself assignments. So uh, one of the things is I said, okay, you can't make anything that's radial composition. Um, you, you can't uh, use that kind of uh, symmetry. You, you have to give up some control. These are so controlled. Um, you can't make any dots. Um, so so um, in the last piece I did was a kind of purge piece. So this, uh, this is called Languidere um, and it, um, Languidere is a character in the, uh, the Frank Baum um, Oz books that I read as a kid. Um, you know, he had a whole series of these books and she was a, a character who, who was, um, she had only one body and she only had one dress, it's this white dress, but she had 30 heads. She only wore one at a time. She kept each head in this, in this room with behind these mirrored cabinets. So she could wear a different head for every day of the month. Um, so she didn't need to change her clothes. Um, it was kind of like a, 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 a children's hydra uh, in, a, in a kind of feminine form or something. Um, but anyway, so the idea here was that I did 30 paintings and I tried to make exactly the same painting 30 times. And you can see just from looking at it, I, I started off okay. Um, and, then, and then things just got out of my control. So here it is. Um, I will just quickly run through some of these. So that was the first one and the second one kind of in the same vein. And then things just started changing and getting stranger and stranger. So that was the purge. And when I say purge, it's like, um, I don't, you, you guys are probably too young to remember this, but in the old days when a parent was trying to get a kid to stop smoking, they would say, here, take these three packs of cigarettes and go sit in the backyard and smoke one after another until you're, you're so sick of it, you don't ever wanna see another cigarette. So that was sort of the idea. Um, so um, I did that and I, what I started doing next was I started splashing paint, throwing paint, uh, splattering it and the, these little um, splatters were stand in for the dots and I had no control over where they landed, right? So they were random. And then I dropped in a, a line, a dividing line. In this case, I, it's way down at the bottom, that red line. And then uh, how to get the labor in there. So what I would do is it was a black background. I splattered white paint on it. And then I spent hours and hours and hours painting around all of the splatters. So all of the blue is the last thing that went on the surface. So here is the dividing line that I'm still obviously not relinquishing the dot thing, but um, you know, it's so obvious, it wasn't obvious to me till I did it, but it's like, oh, okay, this is landscape. This has become a, a horizon line. And the last thing I ever wanted to be was a landscape painter. But you know, I guess you have to be careful what you, you wish uh, against. So um, it is funny that um, Nebraska kind of flips back up once I have that flat horizon line, right? The land and the sky. And I started doing this series of paintings. Clearly I'm still 
doing dot paintings, but I'm trying to loosen up the backgrounds and incorporate uh, a lot more random pores of paint. Um, these are triptychs that are about 225 inches wide. Um, this one I did in a mosaic, which I'll show you later. And you can see that the background was made by just pouring paint and throwing paint around and, and letting it move on its own. And in this case, for instance, all of those lines, all I did was trace the paint. The paint moved and I just, uh, when it was dry, I just put the brush down and pulled it in the direction of the, the paint moving. Um, I love this one, it's called Harmo. And I'm showing it to you mainly because um, this is the detail of it. You can see that on, I just, again, this notion of just following the paint and that's kind of giving up control. It's trying to incorporate the random, it's a system of sorts. Um, and, um, you know, this piece, which I, I like because it's both kind of celestial and, and it's very, um, it's like a geode, right? It's a small thing and a large thing. And even here, an example of this, this method that I started using is I poured the paint, which was that silvery color, but it didn't quite cover. Um, you can see in the, you know, so the black background is showing through and it was a sort of grid, like a portal into another space behind that coating of paint. And all I did was try to extend that grid that was already there into the rest of the painting. So I had two grids going on and they kind of met in the middle. Or this one where, you know, the, this particular canvas that was flat on the floor and all the paint ran to the middle because the, the canvas was sagging. So that determined this, this goofy flower image. Okay, so here's my uh, random uh, segue laterally. I thought I'd show you some of these wallpaper pieces, installations that I've done. This was at Mass Mocha. It's uh, 140 feet long and about 12 feet high. And it, it's printed um, and then I hand worked it. So it is like uh, printmaking. It is printmaking, right? I love the way they installed it because they went around, you know, uh, fire, fire things and doorways. There's a detail of it. Um, it had bilateral symmetry, which is hearkening uh, back to those hollow core door uh, pareidolia pieces. This is me working on my table. Whenever I see myself, I'm always thinking, God, you're short. I thought I was much taller. And this is um, what it looked like with people in it. And this is my favorite view of it. Um, I didn't take this. Uh, the museum's photographer took it. And what makes it so beautiful is not the piece itself, but that blue, that, you know, sort of twilight blue uh, is just, is really lovely. Uh, this is a piece that I did at um, uh, the New Burger, Space 42. And I'm trying not to go over, I'm coming up on 40 minutes here. So I will try to hurry a little bit. Um, this one is that you saw that image before. I did this recently. Um, it's not um, public yet, so but it's um, it's an MTA project that I did for Metro North. Um, and uh, these uh, this company Mosaica in Canada did the fabrication and they did an amazing job. You can see the iridescence, um, you know, kind of bouncing off the the tile, some close-ups. I mean, it's incredible what they did. Okay, um, this next weird section is, uh, uh, what am I doing here? Oh, okay. Uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, influences because people always ask that. We were laughing this morning about how how much we don't like talking about our influences. <laughs> but of course I love Japanese printmaking. And this is um, a Kuniyoshi print. I love the stylization. I love the flatness of it. Uh, this is one of my favorite little 
um, pictures of uh, Minamoto Yoritomo, who's a, a Japanese warlord, lord, but I love that silhouette, that structured silhouette of his robe that's flat and it's black and his, his sword hilt is kind of this weird penis. And um, I think it's just such a beautiful piece. Uh, these are yantras or tantric mandalas or um, they're on gouache, gouache on paper. This is a designer, you can see his name there. I made an homage to him here. Um, the sky that you all know, the Hokusai wave, which has been, you know, it's on mugs and calendars and t-shirts and pajamas. Um, but I made a little homage to him, um, just trying to make the same painting three times, making the same wave painting, or in this case, making it and turning it upside down. Uh, here's a little Fra Angelico angel, beautiful little angel. Um, but what I liked is the um, the uh, feather pattern, the wing pattern behind her, which is basically the Japanese wave pattern. It's just stretched out. Here's my painting, my angel painting. This is Roger Brown, who also is using that wave pattern. And there's my use of the wave pattern. Um, Okay, um, this is a game that I, I have played um, that I, I liked. I just started doing it for fun a while back, finding the image from real life or a photograph after I've already done the painting. So I, it's not an influence that I looked for and then I made the painting, it's the reverse. So for instance, I made this painting, which is about the Sandhill Cranes. I was thinking about the Sandhill Cranes in Nebraska. And then I found this image, which is so much better than the painting. This is a National Geographic uh, photog photograph, just stunning, right? I did this painting, which is clearly in my head about the beginning of Law and Order, right? When they do that pan of the city. Um, this one with meteor showers. This one. Um, uh, uh, which is, uh, I've called it folds, but clearly, you know, once I started looking at things, it's like the Northern Lights. Um, but um, one thing I would, I guess I would say is that you clearly can't compete with nature, right? That I remember Chuck Forsman, who was a painting teacher used to say that uh, to us all the time. But I, I just wanted to stop here and say uh, something about um, uh, sources and what we make art from. And um, I went to a, a talk by Kathy Butterly. I don't know if you know her work. She's an amazing uh, ceramic sculptor. And um, she had said a thing that she, she said, well, you know, I, I just make work from wherever I am at the time. And I thought, what, uh, what? And, um, and I, I thought, God, if one of my students said that to me, I'd be like I, I, all over them. Like, what does that mean? But I actually thought about it later and I thought it was, it was so smart and so wonderful because, you know, we are the, um, we are the accumulation of all the influences in our in experiences of our life. And then I found this great Robert Gober quote. Um, so this is him saying, whenever I give a talk about my work, I'm invariably asked who my influences are, not what, but who as if the gutter, misunderstandings, memories, sex, dreams, and books matter less than the forebearers do. After all, in terms of influences, it is as much the guy who mugged me on 10th Street or my beloved dog who passed away much too early as it was Giotto or Diane Arbus. So I sort of love that. I'll just slip through these quickly. Um, lines of force. Here's my tornado painting. Here's another tornado painting that actually looks very much like the chandelier at the Standard Hotel here in New York City. Um, or this one, which I, I love this because this is, somebody gave this to me. This is an endorphin dragging a protein molecule. And if you go online, you can actually watch it, drag it with music, which is very funny. And the story here is that I made this painting. Uh, again, I can't believe I'm making landscape paintings. And uh, I spent 
30 years going back and forth between New York City and Williamstown, Mass, where I, where I taught. And um, at the end of that time, I'd made this painting and I looked out the window and I saw this hill. It just astounded me, right? I've been driving by this hill years and years and years. I never thought of it and it pops up in my painting. Okay, here's another painting that I made, which is in some ways a lot about the same view that I see out my studio window at night. Um, there's one more painting here. And I think about that wonderful warlord painting here. And I just wanna point out, I'm very honored that, um, I don't know if you know the group Darling Side, but they used this on one of their album covers, my claim to fame. And uh, this one, which is a, a weird little figure, I love it. It's, uh, it, is, it sort of looks like something, a little thing with a big belly, or uh, I'm not quite sure, but really it is, uh, a, I traced it off a piece of peeled paint that was down by my trash cans. And I just thought that was so wonderful. Okay, I'm at 47 minutes and I think I can zip through some of this. Um, these are basically coming to this last group. I hope I can do this. Um, so, you know, this sort of standing in the middle, this whole thing of abstraction, the micro macro, uh, for instance, uh, this is kind of landscapey. It looks kind of like falling stars, but it could be missiles, right? There are two very di different um, ways of reading this. Um, trying to incorporate random events. This one's called the edge, but really um, that whole silhouette at the top is where the paint was wet. It was on the floor. I wasn't paying attention and my dog went over and he ate that edge of paint off. So it, he literally ate that edge and I, I just couldn't believe it. So I just traced it, right? Traced it off, flipped it over and re read put it on the bottom. So the top and the bottom is were, were actual accidents. Um, trying to open up the center. Um, and I started just tracing around things. Uh, it's a printmakerly thing in a kind of low tech way. It's also a doodle. It's like not thinking uh, almost like automated drawing or automatic drawing, <laughs> automatic drawing. Again, this sort of geode outer space thing. Um, where shapes are almost something, but not quite. So it could be a figure in a robe. It could be a blood stain. It could be, you could be looking down on it or across the perspective can change. Um, it could be a rooster. my version of zooming here. Um, and, in, and really trying to incorporate uh, things so that I'm not in control all the time. So for instance, you can see the paint didn't quite cover at the bottom and there are all these little black holes that didn't cover. And I just traced those black grid holes and I sort of transferred them and repeated them uh, over the surface of the painting. Um, I started looking at Japanese uh, paintings and prints. Um, I love this idea that it flips back and forth. So if you read the black shape as the positive, it's a dragon shape or something, or a river. Whereas if you read the green part as the positive, it's a cloud. Barbara, can, this is Dana. Can I ask you a question? What sure. size are these paintings, like the one you just showed, for example? Uh, this is uh, 45 inches by 54. Yeah, that's my that's my comfort zone, that size, or 60 by 70. Yeah, please ask me anything. I, I'm, I'm very aware of the time, so I'm trying not to go too far. You're doing over. great with the time. No, it's perfect, and we're loving it. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, this one is called AA, and... Um, it's funny, it started out like this. Um, and honestly, it scared me. Uh, I would come into the studio and it looked like a figure, 
a figure to me. And I had just seen some scare, scary TV show called The Terror. Um, and anyway, it, and it, it just scared me too much. I couldn't stand having it in the studio. So what I did is I just, I turned it sideways and it became this floating shape, like an island or a submarine or a fish or something. Um, and this, you can see this, this sort of red drip on the right, far right side. That actually to me makes the painting. And uh, I had been painting on sawhorses because I couldn't get to the middle since I paint flat. So I tilted the painting up to get to the middle. I arranged the sawhorses so I could tilt the painting. And what I didn't realize was that I, I had spilled a big blob of paint on, on it, on this canvas. And when I tipped it, it just ran down the side. And I, I literally had uh, two minutes to either wipe it up or leave it. And it was like, oh my God. Uh, and so I left it and I actually think that it's my favorite part of the painting. Um, so these are later works, um, probably uh, a couple years ago. And it's, um, I love the fact that it's, it's, it's paint. It's a mark, you know, kind of a Lichtenstein, like it's a mark, it's a paint thing, but it's almost, it's a column, it's a figure. It's like, uh, uh, is it waving hello? Is it, uh, you know, I don't know. It's a Rorschach kind of thing. Uh, again, is this a pile of crap? Is it a Philip Guston, Bart Simpson conglomeration head? Is it, um, is it giving you the eyeball, a sidelong eyeball? Um, this curtain starts appearing, which is again, a kind of re revision of the red curtain, the blood curtain. Um, sometimes these things would pop up. There were little uh, votives or smoke rings or geysers or uh, bodhisattvas or something. And I did this uh, piece, which is quite large. This is about um, 72 inches by uh, 18 feet. Uh, and it's a five panel piece. Clearly I didn't try to make it look like they weren't panels. Um, and I, and it, again, it could be like the black shape is a river, a close up of a swooping river. It could be, somebody said, oh yeah, it looks like you know two phalluses, uh, I don't know. Um, but um, here's a close up of it. And just for all you painters, it's interesting. I, I sort of paint backwards. It's like printmaking. The, the thing that was painted last um, is the blue, uh, the blue wave pattern. Uh, the thing that was painted first is the gray. And then I, and then I had to paint out everything around um, those shapes. Because you would normally think the white shapes would come onto the dark background, but it, it was the reverse. Barbara, um, can I interrupt? I'm sorry, now I'm getting comfortable with interrupting you. <laughs> so I like it. I interrupting like it. With one other question. This has never occurred to me until until seeing um, your work, but how like how influential and in conversation with your paintings are with like someone like Jackie Saccaccio's paintings. And um, th they're different, but I see I see similarities and also like the influence of your work on someone like Chie Fueki. And I'm wondering if you think about about um, the, some of these other painters at all, or do you, you know, some artists tend to kind of have blinders on and just forge ahead. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, yes, that's a good question. You know, um, Jackie Sococho, I love her work. And um, uh, sadly, she, she's, she's passed away, but I, um, that actually, uh, um, you know, I didn't really think about it. I had been thinking, you know, these are all sort of what I call faux abex gestures, right? Dripping, uh, pouring uh, paint, tipping the canvas. It, it, it's a dance that I have adopted, but it, I'm not a believer, right? I mean, I don't, I'm not really an abex person. I don't, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the faith in it or something. Um, it's a means to an end, but, um, once I did realize that, for instance, uh, some of these uh, drips, the way they, uh, they form, especially when they crawl and they kind of go into these little uh, marks and lines, which is a very Jackie uh, signature thing. And I realized it was, it, it's hers in a way, it's her image, right? So, so I have to stop using it is basically <laughs> what I realized, right? Um, 
I, I just, I, I, I wasn't aware of it until uh, then I was, and now I have to stop. So that's that question. Uh, Chie's work, I'm a big fan of. Um, I don't, I don't think it's interesting. I'll have to talk to you more about that. I, I don't feel that she's particular that I particularly influenced her or vice versa, but, um, but I love her work. Yeah. So I'd be curious. We could talk about that, right? What, Sounds what, good. Uh, yeah. Yeah, what, what I'd be I'd be so curious about that. Um, sorry, I'm just checking my dog here. All right, so so this piece, which is called uh, Shibaraku, and it and what I wanted to do was make again opening up the center and make. I thought it'd be so funny to make a painting that was giant, huge, and that there was nothing in the middle and just a couple things on each edge. I just for some reason that just seemed perversely funny to me. Um, but I couldn't leave the middle empty. So the middle is all of these little connect the dots, kind of cons fake constellation, connect the dots. Um, and then these uh, little missiles or, um, you know, whatever they, they are. Um, but they, they, the paint is, they, they is, when you look at them straight on, they're white. So you don't see them. And then when you look at them from an angle, they flare up and they turn pink. So I thought that was fun because it's like nothing and then something. Or here's the middle, uh, one of the uh, edges of the where they meet. And again, the paint didn't cover. So um, I think I can keep some of this kind of thing versus the actual sort of more clearly uh, dripping uh, thing when we're talking about Jackie's work. So there's one side, here's the other side. Um, this one is called, uh, what is it called? 20,000 miles. Um, and again, I had wanted to leave that whole black uh, shape blank. It, it was quite beautiful when it, when it, after I did the pour and I came in the next day and it was, it was glossy in some areas and matte in other areas and some places had texture and some didn't, but I just couldn't, I couldn't leave it. And that's the old uh, obsessiveness rearing its head. So I actually went in and tried to paint um, these dots that were uh, sometimes invisible and sometimes visible. So that, you know, as somebody had said to me, it's invisible labor. Like, why don't you just paint black dots on a black background? And then you'll get the labor in there. You'll be able to do it, but then you'll actually have a, a flat thing. Um, um, and I think this is one of the last paintings. Um, this is called Pearlescent. It's, uh, what is it, 70 by 60. And um, what was I gonna say about this one? Something I wanted to say. Um, oh, I know, I wanted to talk a little bit about how lately it's been interesting to me that the the physical forces that operate in a painting are the same that operate in, in the larger realm. For instance, um, I've been thinking a lot that gravity plays a big part in these works in that, you know, I, I pour the paint on, it depends on how dilute or how viscous it is. I don't control that a lot of times, whether it moves, whether it drags, whether the canvas is tight or whether it's, it's loose, whether it, the gravity is making the paint move toward the center or the gravity is making it move sometimes in other directions. Um, sometimes a stretcher bar sits up too high and everything pulls away. Um, and I was thinking of, uh, you know, that when they, when they do that sort of beginning science thing, when they show you what, how a planet makes gravity, you know, you think of it as this ball bearing in space and it, the weight of it, you know, sort of warps space around it, which is that uh, a way to, envision gravity. And I was thinking, yeah, it's the same, the same process that's going on in this little painting as in the big world. The the capital, the capital M and the lower case M. Um, so I guess the only thing is I would say that um, there's a lot of the one and the many, the change and no change. And even as I say this, I realize I've been repeating these things throughout. And I think that that to me is funny because the lecture itself is a lot like a painting, right? It, it, it has all those same 
<laughs> aspects to it. So in closing, what I would like to say is um, just total non sequiturs. I was, um, <laughs> I was, there's a terrible TV show. Honestly, it's terrible, but I, I, I started binge watching it. Um, I never saw it before, Criminal Minds, right? And it's a, a kind of a procedural like Law and Order or something. And they do this thing that makes me crazy, which is they are always quoting, uh, get, be, quoting people. And it's like a yearbook, you know, when you're in high school yearbooks, they, some high schools make you come up with a quote. And I, I just always thought that was so sort of ridiculous and awful, but I'm going to do it anyway. So, uh, so I found these quotes and these are all non sequitur, sequitur. Some of them actually have nothing to do with anything, but um, I thought it would be fun to end this way. So here's one from Jasper Johns. If you avoid everything you can avoid, then you do what you can't avoid doing and you do what is helpless and unavoidable. I love that. I have to think about that all the time. Lily Tomlin um, was giving advice to young people. She said, don't leave the house when you're drunk. Behind every failure is an opportunity somebody wishes they had missed. Um, here's one from Jim Nutt, the artist. My work isn't even close to an idea. It's just something that I'm doing. This is from Jerry Saltz, who's an art critic. It doesn't matter how scared you are. Everyone is scared. Work. Work is the only thing that takes away the curse of fear. Uh, Joyce Pensado, wonderful artist, uh, painter. As I get older and shorter, I'm thinking bigger. And the last quote is from Cher. Um, she says, sometimes you're great and sometimes you're pathetic. Sometimes you're tired and sometimes you break down. It should be like that and nothing should be glossed over. The end. And I came in at, oh my God, an hour. Sorry. Uh, that was a great hour. Thank you for that. That was really, I mean, it was so thought provoking. I was like, took me a second to turn my screen back on because I was actually writing down some of what you said. So thank you. Thank you for that uh, beautiful lecture, Barbara. And we have so many questions. I hope that's okay. I'm going to just um, start going through them. Um, there, qu the questions so far that I'm seeing are kind of ranging from um, more mundane things to bigger picture issues. And so I was going to start off with a really um, simple question, which is, can you tell us about some of, some of the tools that you use? like paint brushes, kinds of paint, things like that. I know they're all acrylic. Uh, yes, um, you know, I don't have any, well, the one, the one fancy tool th that I have <laughs> or that I discovered is liner brushes, right? Like I didn't, I didn't, um, I only took one painting class when I was in grad, in school, undergraduate and graduate school. So I never really learned how to paint in a kind of proper way. And I just, I didn't, so I didn't even know that brushes that there were different kinds of brushes. I thought, right. it, I thought it didn't matter. So then somebody gave me a bunch of brushes like uh, wedges and uh, liner brushes and daggers and, and it, it opened up a whole world. So I love liner brushes because you can pull a line uh, from sort of, you know, I, I, I don't know, uh, six feet without running out of paint. So that's mainly it. Otherwise I just use little tiny, tiny brushes. Right. Um, okay. Another question is living in New York city. Do you, I mean, I think someone is asking if the city has influenced your work. And I think that quote that you read, um, I can't remember who it was talking about. I think it was the Robert Gober quote about influences. I have to imagine that it has influenced your work, but maybe if you could say a little bit about that. Um, yes. Um, I think the city has influenced my work in ways that are not quite visible, but definitely there. Um, one thing that I like, uh, and I, I think is so great about going to graduate school, I would go to back to graduate school in a heartbeat. Um, it's in it, in, and graduate school to me is sort of like this sort of smaller version of living in a big city, which is that when you have a community, you have a lot of people around you that are being creative, um, you know, it, it, boosts, it boosts your own creativity. And part of it is um, maybe competition, and part of it is just um, conversation that you're talking to the person that's painting next door, or you know, suddenly you have a group of people in New York that you're going to their shows and their studios. And 
I think that makes a big difference. I mean, I definitely think one could be very creative um, and a wonderful artist living in solitude in the middle of, you know, the country somewhere, but um, I think it's harder. So I think that part of the city is great. And the, and in New York, what I love about New York um, has maybe less to do with art and more to do with the fact that I love, uh, you know, I lived in Nebraska, I lived in Colorado. When I came to the city, I went, oh my God, I'm home. Because there were so many different kinds of people. There were, um, you know, people speaking different languages. There were uh, short people, tall people. There were all kinds of races. There were, uh, uh, I loved that sort of hustle hustle of the city and I loved how um, kind of more um, blunt and clear in some ways people in, in New York are versus, uh, you know, where I grew up where, which is wonderful, but everybody's so kind, right? And, and, <laughs> and I always felt like I was so wishy-washy. I needed to learn how to be a little more direct. And I thought, ah, oh, New York is so great that way. I love that about the city too. I felt, yeah. I felt I'm yeah. very connected. I always, um, wonder, are people really that kind? Or are they just pretending or anyway? <laughs> <laughs> um, what, well, one related question, uh, well, two, two sort of related questions. First of all, living in New York, do you, I mean, before, before, before the whole quarantine and COVID thing, do you still have a lot of people coming into your studio and do you remain part of the dialogue or do you tend to sort of sit in your studio and um, only have people look at the work when it's finished? Um, okay. I, I, uh, I sort of missed the beginning of that. Cause I was thinking, God, should I end this slideshow? Should I, oh, but no. you were talking, you were talking about the quarantine and itself and how it's changed. Do you continue to, um, when you were talking about graduate school and the conversation and dialogue that gets started, do you continue to have, um, peers and people come look at your work while you're in the pro process of making it, or do you tend to make it, you know, um, and not show it to people until it's finished? Um, yeah. Uh, and I'd be curious what, what you do about this too, because I, I have so many artist friends who love studio visits. I don't like them at all. I mean, I will do them and I love my friends and I love my dealer and I love, I love having them over, but it's, it's, um, uh, it's it's hard for me because I am I am easily swayed, right? So if I'm making a work for a show and somebody comes in and says, "Oh, this sucks," <sighs> you know, even if I thought it was great before they came in, then I, suddenly I'm like, "Oh no, I have to start over," and I don't want to. I just it's hard enough for me to pay attention to my own, you know, head and my own voice. So I I feel like I just, for better or for worse, I am forging ahead, and then um, sometimes I will. Uh, I love uh, some of my artist friends who are, who will, who are so clear with me. It'll be like, I'll just send them images and I'll go A or B and they'll go B or it's like too much red. And they'll go, yeah. And you know, it's sort of like nuts and bolts. And I'm like, yeah, okay, this is good. I, I, that's what I need. Um, so I, I like having people in, I guess, when, when, when it's, it's done. And even if they hate everything, I can't, do anything about it. Right. But I don't know. Do you like studio visits? It depends. I mean, I kind of um, can really relate to what you were talking about where you have, the, I have this group of people where we're either on FaceTime or texting and it's like thumbs up next to the finished one, <laughs> thumbs down next to the, you know, we have our whole little language. So I still feel, um, like I do rely, they're like a, a certain stable of people that I rely upon, but I also understand what you're saying. Like the more formal studio visit can be really stressful. Yeah. Um, if, yeah. If the timing's not right. And, and, and again, that's the thing I love about, since I've been talking to your graduate students is that's what's so lovely about school is, you know, everybody, you're with a bunch of people that are, and they're all talking art and they're all thinking art, right? It's a, a, a rarity that you have um, in life. <laughs> I yeah. know. Imagine if we could go back to grad school more than once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Um, okay. Moving on though, to, the, to another sort of related question is, um, would you feel like when you're, when you were talking about making the transition from some of your earlier work into some of your more recent work, do you feel that you, um, 
you know, you know, the piece where you made the same painting a number of times and there was change in it, and then you moved on to something new. Do you feel that you change as a person? Like you're going through some kind of like inner transition as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, I don't know if I said it uh, because I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't read my notes very well. Um, the, the reason that I got to that point is I think I was making those paintings as a, as a, as I said, as a way of grieving, and and it was it was a it was a compulsion to make those paintings. I really didn't have a choice, and I loved making them. Um, and then and then one day I was done. I was done grieving, and I was I was just was done. And then I didn't want to make the work anymore. So it was a real correlation. Right. You know, it wasn't a, a conceptual thought. It was uh, it was. Um, um, you know, it, it sort of happened to me versus me making it happen. Right, makes sense. Um, another question is, can you talk a little bit about your relationship to the color blue? Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, I was asking who, uh, this morning, I can't remember everybody's name, but about, we we're talking about color palette. Um, it's not like I have a big thing for blue, but yeah, it's it seems everywhere in my work. And, um, you know, people have asked me about color and uh, how I choose color. And I um, am, am very bad because I, when I need a color, literally I go red, yellow, blue, green. <laughs> I mean, I, it's just like, okay, it could be one of those colors. That's how I think about color. And it's like, I don't really like purple and I don't like yellow so much. And I like red and I like blue, right? And then, but I don't want to get patriotic. So, so it ends up being blue a lot. And, uh, um, and I also use color kind of straight out. I, you know, I have taught painting and I always tell my painting students, right? You, you're not allowed to use anything out of the tube. You, you have to, you have want a red, you've got to mix that red, but I don't do that. I just use the red that, that comes out of the jar, right? So, yeah. So I don't have a good answer about the blue. That was a great answer. I mean, there's also like a whole history, you know, connection with the color blue. And um, anyway, I'm going to move on so that um, we can ask as many questions as we as we can. Um, the next question is from another student who was asking about your relationship to pouring and and letting things settle where they where they do on the canvas. Do you set any sort of stipulations for yourself um, when you're beginning? or do you have a vague composition in mind or do you literally just start pouring and, and then respond as you go? Um, I, you know, I have enough of an idea in terms of mixing up the color, right? So I know what colors I want. And, um, and it's, it's interesting that I, I should have by now uh, formulated a way to, to know what's going to happen a little bit more in terms of like whether a paint's too thick or too thin or what happens when they mix, but I haven't, right? I just, I, it's like every time is a new thing and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, so I know that what I want the color maybe to do, or I, I might know that, oh, I want um, a big uh, shape to be on an edge or something. But uh, other than that, I'm, and I don't do sketches beforehand. So I just sort of do it. And it's my way of um, trying to relinquish control and, and embrace change. And because I don't know what's going to happen. So for instance, this piece that's on the, on the, on the screen right now, um, I had, I had, in, I had made this, uh, another painting with this same kind of color combination. And, and it had, it was the very first image that I showed you. And it had the white had kind of mixed with the blue and it made, and it dried in these crazy um, scalloped um, patterns, like a flower. It, it, it was stunning. I mean, I could have never come up with that. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to do that again. That was great. I'm going to do another one. And then the white just sat there. The white hardly moved at all. And then when it moved, like this detail that you could, it, it moved down and then came in a direction and then it changed directions and it went the other way. And it's like, I don't, I don't know. Um, so, I, so I, I don't, I like that fact that every, that before every painting was the same and now every painting is different because I don't know what's going to happen. And one thing that I will say about this whole pouring thing that, uh, that is a bit like the printmaking thing, which is I do the pours at the end of the day and then I leave 
I mean, that's a big part of it. And I go home and I come back the next day and I can't wait. It's like, you know, you make a print and that part where you're pulling the paper off the plate and you're going, oh, please, dear God, let this be okay. And you're pulling it out. And then it's like, especially if it's good, it's like, damn, that was great. And um, so that's the thing is like, I can't wait to see what, what has happened to it because sometimes it's great. And sometimes it's just, you know, nothing. Do you work on more than one painting at a time? Like, will you do three pours at the end of the day? Or is it like seeing one painting all the way through to the end? I've started working on multiple paintings. And mainly the reason is, um, uh, I'm sure so many of you guys do this. I, um, I let the painting sit there against the wall and it just sits there, right? For sometimes for months. Uh, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I don't know what to do. And then one day it'll be like, oh, put something red over there. And I'm like, oh yeah, I should have thought of that. And so, so it, I think uh, if I were only working on one painting that would never work time-wise. I mean, you can kind of see like, I don't know if you can see it, they're all sort of laid out in the, yeah. against the wall, just waiting to, waiting, for, waiting to tell me what to do. I say that they're baking when that happens, they're cooking. <laughs> but okay, have you ever had to sacrifice like all of the fine detail that you have, for example, in the image that we're looking at, have you ever had to sacrifice any of that like intense work, line work um, with, with a pour on top or, or do we see, are, are we always seeing the, the labor? Does that, you were, you know, and it makes me think about what you were saying also with the black dots on the black um, form. Right. But, well, but actually that, that's really good. That would be, oh, okay. Well, to answer your question, yes, I have done that, but, but only recently where um, uh, something, uh, I just couldn't figure out what to, like, I don't know if you remember. So the very first slide that I showed, I don't know that I can get to it, probably not. Uh, no, I can't get to it. Um, um, it, it. I just couldn't figure out what to do with it. And so what I finally did is I just took a big, a tub of black paint and I poured it down the middle because mm -hmm. I just was at my wits end. And actually that, that was a thing that was great, but there had been a lot of work under there. Right. right. And um, this is how, uh, you know, myopic one can get when you're in the studio, right. You're used to your own methods. And it never occurred to me to do a pour over a pour. Like, mm -hmm. of course that seems so simple, but I, it didn't occur to me. And now that you say it, that is another great idea that yeah. I could do a lot of labor and then just cover it up. So it's still a lot of labor, but you can't see it. It's gone. I mean, that's an invisible labor thing, right? Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that idea of invisible labor. Yeah. Um, another question is you noted that young artists have to decide what to make art about. Do you have any advice for them on how to make those decisions? No. I don't <laughs> It's so hard, so hard. I mean, I just think uh, I remember floundering around a lot. And I, and I tried to I remember at one point I, I tried to put little Japanese girls, women, you know, uh, figures in the corners. And I just, you know, it was because I was trying really hard to make it happen and trying really hard to think about what was important to me and then put it in the work. And uh, I don't know. For me, that was that was really tough. I, I just think um, that's why I'm a big advocate of work because I think you can work through things and that you that it comes up on its own. Like uh, again, it's uh, fresh from the morning critiques, and you know it's sort of like certain people love certain colors. Like what what's up with that? And and it it, it it's a thing. Or uh, you repeat a motif and it keeps coming up over and over. And what's up with that? And suddenly you can look back at your work and put it together and then you kind of see what you're making work about, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, two more questions because I know we're getting close to, to when you have crits again. Um, can you please talk about the dot and have you kind of made your piece with the dot and do you expect it? Because at some point you mentioned you were trying to get away from it a little bit. Do you, ex do you have expectations that the dot may or may like, what are your thoughts about it? And do you plan on continuing to paint dots? Um, yes, I, I am. I, 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 even when I tried to relinquish it, I, I, um, I still am doing it. There are 
paintings now that don't have any in them. So I'd say, you know, 50% of the time there are no dots. Right. And maybe at some point they won't. It, it, it seemed a little bit like there's so many dot painters out there. I mean, we could form our own tribe, our little country of dot painters. And um, the, the thing, the people who, who, who paint dots though, the thing about it, when you're trying to make, like in the early work, when you're trying to make work that's repetitive and obsessive and, um, and uh, kind of comforting, there is great pleasure in making a dot. If you try to make a square or a rectangle or any other kind of simple shape, it's not nearly as much fun. <laughs> you know, there's that swoosh and it just goes around, you know, it's, it's no like fine tuning it or, you know, it's just a, it's a blob. It could be circular. It can be, you know, asymmetrical. It can be, you know, goofy, but there's a, there's, there's pleasure in the actual gesture of it. Whereas I think uh, other things, if, if I'm trying to adopt something that is basic vocabulary, it's, it's tougher. I think line also, especially with liner brushes, line has that pleasure also. I agree with you about line. Um, Cause it can go on for, it can just, you can keep going with it. Okay. Last question. Can you just tell us about a, a, a basic day? What's it like for you? Do you, are you an early studio person or do you tend to work late into the night? Tell us about a, a regular studio day for you. Um, okay, well, it depends on if we're talking about the before time or <laughs> pandemic time. <laughs> but either uh, one, either one. Yeah, you know what? I uh, I'm not an early riser, and I, um, you know, I think it's interesting that writers they they seem to like to wake up really early and write, and then have the day. But um, I I don't know how people do that. I just um, and the older I get, the longer it takes me to get out of the apartment. So it takes a long time, but. I usually get here. I'm usually driven to get to the, not driven in a car, but like, it's like, oh my God, I get to, got to get to the studio. And, and all I do is think about it and rush and get, and then when I get here, it's like, oh, let's read the paper. I know. You know let's order lunch, you know, whatever. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of laissez faire about once I get here, but I need to be here. And um, I usually go to the studio, you know, seven days a week. And I, I, um, Unless I have, like in the old days when there were openings and dinner parties and things, um, unless I have something to do at night, I usually work till about nine or 10 at night. That's, yeah. that's a long day. That's very interesting. And I think even you were saying you rush to the studio and then you're like reading the paper, but you're still looking, you know, it's still in your peripheral vision and stuff. So you're sort of processing. Yeah, I, right now I, um, I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea that taking time off is work also. In other words, taking time off feeds the work as much that's as right. racing to get to the studio. So um, that's Are you, oh, I froze for a minute. Okay, Barbara, thank you so much. I cannot thank you, know, thank you enough for the generous lecture and answering all these questions. And it's been such a pleasure to have you at U of H. And I know the rest of the students are looking forward to meeting with you as well. Yes, so, well, thank you. This was really fun. Okay, sign.